everyone should be on. Okay. I guess more people will come in and be on as they come on. And so, uh, except for the five or six of us that are uh, on this, everybody else will be muted. So hey, everybody. Uh, my group is coming in as well. Uh, this is Tom Gregory here in Portland, Oregon uh, at OHSU. And um, thanks for joining us this evening. We're doing uh, another one of our FPMRS journal, journal clubs that uh, is coming live <laughs> from uh, the Bay Area, the San Francisco Bay Area. So we have the Kaiser Oakland and UCSF uh, team uh, who will kind of be presenting a couple articles. And um, uh, we'll get some introductions to you in a, in a moment. Um, you hopefully all received your um, articles through the announcement and downloaded them perhaps and looked at them or maybe you're gonna hear about them for the first time tonight, that's fine. Um, when we let you in the room, we defaulted you to a um, muted microphone. If you're on the computer, that also probably means you are, um, your video is blinded. Um, feel free to open and close it if you as you wish. Um, there aren't a lot of us tonight, so I think that uh, you can kind of just chime in if you have questions. Um, I'll keep an eye on how many participants we have, but a lot of times I, if we have multiple participants, uh, kind of try to utilize the uh, chat room feature or have you kind of um, use the buttons of the Zoom um, uh, feature to kind of, I don't know, raise your hand to say, hey, I want to say something. But again, because it's a small enough group, I think this will work out just to kind of um, just unmute yourself and, and ask a question. But feel free also to, to use the chat feature because um, sometimes while the presentation is going on, it's kind of fun to sort of uh, have a little off, off uh, conversation. So um, just this really is meant to be a lot like a local journal club where we're all sitting in the same room. So um, it's not really meant to be a lecture. So we love to have it be interactive in the two ways I just described to you. Um, we've actually invited the authors of these papers and Megan Shannon is with us as well today. So that's really nice. So we'll get a little bit of insight from her. Um, I think I've mentioned uh, the sort of the other housekeeping features. Just as a preview, we do have um, another scheduled one of these in a couple of months. Um, I think Jeff Cornella is actually on line with us tonight, uh, but it's gonna be uh, at, from the Mayo Scottsdale program. And I think the date is, and I got, let me make sure I get this right because I got it wrong the last time. February 10th, 2020, 9 a.m. Eastern time, 6 a.m. Pacific time is the, is the time that I have lined up. Um, so if that's not right, uh, somebody will let me know. Um, yeah. So that's really it. We're here to kind of just uh, uh, get a little journal club going. Um, and um, I'm just kind of going to look here. So we've got our, our, our sort of AUGS host, Veronica, Caitlin and v Victor at, at UCSF uh, Kaiser Oakland, Michelle Morrill at uh, on the other side of the bay will, is online, Steve Manalia in Hawaii is here. I see Jeff Cornella. I see John David. Hi, Kate Brown and Megan. So that's, that's what we have right now. And um, I'm gonna turn it over to either Michelle or the, the, our Caitlin and Victor. Well, I'll, I'll take it for just a moment. Um, I just wanted to take an opportunity to introduce to everybody our fellows. So uh, Caitlin Painter is coming to us from the Kaiser Oakland residency and she's now our second year fellow here at the Kaiser Oakland UCSF combined fellowship. Um, she, and just to kind of point out her interests, are OB pelvic floor trauma as well as chronic pelvic pain. Victor Velasco has come to us from LAC and USC residency, and he's interested in sexual function. So I have a suspicion that a big part of doing this uh, pelvic floor physical therapy review was part of his drive. Thank you, Victor. Um, and I also, uh, again, just want to point out Megan Shannon joining us as one of the authors for one of the papers that they chose. Um, and we're looking forward to her input. Um, she had done her fellowship at Loyola, where, which is where this work was done, and is now in Virginia in private practice. Um, and with that, let me let Caitlin and Victor take it away. 
Thank you so much. Um, so we'll just go ahead and get started with our first paper. Um, and how we have it sort of designed for tonight is to try to go through both papers and then kind of have a discussion at the end. But um, feel free to interrupt at any point um, to have a discussion. We have the little chat group on the side, so we were able to see if you have questions or um, different um, ideas for us. Um, all right, so the first paper is Compliance with Pelvic Floor Physical Therapy in Patients Diagnosed with High Tone Pelvic Floor Disorders. Um, and this was done by Catherine Woodburn um, with Cecile Ferrando as the uh, last author, um, done out of the Cleveland Clinic. Um, and just looking at both of these papers, looking at pelvic floor physical therapy, um, the idea for this is that you know, we, we really utilize our pelvic floor physical therapists a lot. And I remember uh, starting in residency and, and meeting a mentor who said, you know, if you find a good pelvic floor physical therapist, they're worth your weight in gold. Um, and so hopefully we've invited some pelvic floor physical therapists to be here today. Um, and they're both with patients. So hopefully they'll be able to join um, and have their input as well. Because I do think that they're such an important part of what we do. Um, and so chronic pelvic pain. Caitlin, I, I'd like to just call out, um, I don't know how much she wants to talk, but I see that one of our physical therapists, Yvette, is on. Oh, and wonderful. Yvette, I would welcome you to jump in with anything. Um, exactly. So it's really important that we are, we're doing this multidisciplinary work. So please, if the, uh, Kim, if you join too, hopefully we can get some input from our physical therapists. Um, so chronic pelvic pain affects about 15% of women worldwide, and this is likely an underestimate of a number. Um, and potentially 30 to 70% of these patients have a musculoskeletal etiology, um, whether it is the etiology that uh, is musculoskeletal or it's um, a response, it's hard to know. Um, and I think the studies are still coming out on how much this is actually affecting women um, but we do know that a multidisciplinary approach with pelvic floor physical therapy is the mainstay of treatment for high tone pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, and this, they used high tone pelvic floor dysfunction, but it's been called multiple things in the literature, whether it's somatic dysfunction or myofascial pain or myofascial spasm. But for the, the rest of this article, we use high tone pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, and prior studies on pelvic floor physical therapy have looked at barriers to pelvic floor physical therapy, um, but not specifically um, for high tone pelvic floor dysfunction. So for instance, there was several papers looking at um, pelvic floor physical therapy for uh, pelvic organ prolapse and for urinary incontinence. And they found that a lack of insurance coverage as well as poor perception of treatment efficacy were some barriers to pelvic floor physical therapy, but little has been done on patient compliance specifically. So the objective of this paper was to describe patient compliance with pelvic floor physical therapy specifically for high tone pelvic floor dysfunction um, as well as to compare patients who are compliant with those who are not compliant with the prescribed pelvic floor physical therapy. And then additionally, they had a se second objective to look at and describe second line treatments that were offered for high tone pelvic floor um, for those patients that specifically return to their prescribing providers. So this is a retrospective cohort study done out of Cleveland Clinic of women diagnosed with high tone pelvic floor disorders between January 2009 and December 2016. Um, and they queried their EMR for referrals placed for pelvic floor physical therapy associated with ICD-10 codes. Um, and what I liked about this paper was that they use multiple different codes um, because in trying to do um, research in pain, specifically in pelvic pain, it's coded um, variably um, and this, I think, while it may not all be specifically myofascial, it can, uh, all of these different codes can sort of cast a wide net to try to catch everyone that is, could potentially be associated with a myofascial component to their pelvic pain. Um, they also validated this by a single investigator um, who did chart review on every single one of the, their patients. They had several exclusion criteria, including a primary diagnosis of urinary incontinence. So um, they could have uh, concom in pelvic floor dysfunction, but it couldn't be the primary diagnosis that was associated with the referral for pelvic floor physical therapy. 
They excluded women who had undergone uh, prior pelvic floor physical therapy um, or if the physical therapy was part of a perioperative plan or if they were within six weeks postoperatively. Um, they um, excluded women that were less than 18 or over 90 or, or who were currently uh, pregnant. They also a priori before they looked at um, any of the analysis categorized uh, patients as uh, or plan to categorize patients as compliant versus non-compliant. Um, and they defined non-compliant specifically as not being formally discharged from therapy by their treating therapist. All right. All the included charts were queried for patient demographics and all office and all uh, physical ther therapy encounters were also reviewed. Uh, and they looked at multiple different things. Um, so I just see that Kim just signed on here. So Kim is one of our Kaiser physical therapists. So Kim, I just want to invite you to uh, add your input as, a, as one of our physical therapists here. You're welcome to jump in at any time. Um, so our, they, they queried the EMR for uh, patient demographics and multiple variables, including mental health disease. So they looked at specifically a history of depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, and PTSD. Uh, they looked at comorbid medical conditions, so they were considered to have a comorbid medical condition if they had the presence of two or more diagnoses, which included a vast array of diagnoses of hypertension, heart disease, diabetes, kidney disease, COPD, Alzheimer's disease. They had a, a long list of those in the paper. Um, and I think what was is also really important is looking at the presence of other pain syndromes. So they specifically looked at uh, whether they had a diagnosis of migraines, irritable bowel disease, bladder pain syndrome, uh, endometriosis, and fibromyalgia. And then all physical therapy encounters were reviewed. Specifically, they were looking at numbers. So they looked at the number of pelvic floor physical therapy sessions that were recommended by the therapist, the numbers that were attended, and the numbers that were shown as a, uh, marked down as a no-show. And then for the patients that returned to their referring provider, they looked at the second line treatments that were offered. And of those that returned, they did ask some patients about why they were non-compliant. And in general, uh, they were able to group those into five categories. So minimal or no improvement from the treatment, anxiety associated with the treatment, uh, treatment costs too high or no insurance coverage, uh, and uh, recommended therapy was too time intensive or some other reason. So looking at the results, this is their table one, looking at patient characteristics. So overall during the study time frame, they had 758 patients that met inclusion criteria with a mean age of 44 years old and a mean BMI of 26.8 and median parity of two. Um, and then 72% uh, of their patients were sexually active and unsurprisingly, uh, 85.9% reported sexual dysfunction, which is what we would uh, expect in a patient population with high tone pelvic floor. Um, but I just wanted to point that out. And then you can see that um, there are uh, several comorbid uh, pain conditions, including 20% of the patients having migraines. Um, I thought 6.3% for uh, bladder pain syndrome was a little bit small, but um, uh, you can also see here, um, down here, um, that they, there was a good percentage of them that had some prior uh, pelvic floor surgery or hysterectomy. So they had a total of 81.1% patient, of patients referred to internal pelvic floor physical therapy. Um, and so they were able to get a good amount of data on um, their patients and the, specifically the pelvic floor physical therapy plan and compliance. So 87.3% of the patients had available data. Um, and what you can see here is that the compliance was very low. So 42.9, so almost half of the patients did not attend any pelvic floor physical therapy sessions. 6.9% um, attended only one, and around 20%, 19.4% were fully compliant, meaning they uh, completed all of the physical therapy sessions recommended and were discharged by their treating physician. So this is poor compliance. So this table looks at the non-compliant patients uh, versus compliant patients um, and compares uh, compares the two to each other. Um, the two 
variables that are different between, statistically different between compliant and non-compliant patients is tobacco use here and mental health disease here. So 18% of uh, non-compliant patients use tobacco compared to 8.7% in the compliant population, um, as well as mental health disease. So uh, if you are non-compliant, you are more likely to use tobacco and more likely to have mental health disease. Um, and they did do a logistic regression. Um, I, one of the interesting parts of this study is that they said they controlled for variables, but you don't know specifically what they controlled for um, in, the, in the logistic regression. But after, after their logistic regression, they found that the, both tobacco use and mental health disease remain statistically significant. So for tobacco use, they had an adjusted odd ratio of 1.9, um, and with, for mental health conditions, they had an adjusted odd ratio of 3.1. Um, what, uh, what else is interesting about this, um, this data is that both age here as well as uh, menopausal status, which is likely just a reflection of age, trended towards significance. Um, so non-compliant patients tended to be younger um, and uh, premenopausal. Um, and so I thought that was really interesting. The other, the other interesting thing down here is prior hysterectomy. So uh, the compliant patients tended to have, have a prior hysterectomy. Um, and the only reason why I could think of why that might be is p potentially the, those patients were older as well, but these were not statistically significant, but had a trend in that way. I would propose that another reason might be that they'd had hysterectomies done by providers who did it for pain. And now that that hadn't worked, they were more motivated to go to physical therapy. Yeah, that is possible as well. Um, any other thoughts on this uh, table or this slide before I move on? Um, so they did look at the different prescribing providers. So there was 10 prescribing providers. Um, and what they found was that there was no difference between patient compliance between the 10 prescribing providers. So there was not one provider whose patients were more compliant than others. Um, and they did specifically look at documentation of provider counseling, whether it was a follow-up telephone call, a follow-up visit, um, or or any type of outreach to the patient. And even with documentation of the provider saying they counseled and encouraged patients to go to pelvic floor physical therapy, that did not increase compliance. Um, a total of 43.1% of patients did return to their pri providers after uh, referral. Um, and not surprising, those that were non-compliant with pelvic floor physical therapy were less likely to return. So on follow-up visits, uh, they were they did ask 86 patients why they were not compliant, and the two uh, most common reasons was minimal or no improvement with treatment, as well as the recommended therapy was too time intensive. Um, and what was interesting about minimal or no improvement with treatment is that we were unable to see from uh, the this retrospective study how many uh, visits these patients actually attended. So it's possible that they attended one pelvic floor physical therapy visit. Um, and so, you know, there, there is that thought that maybe these patients aren't giving the pelvic floor phys physical therapy enough time to be efficacious. Um, and then 64% of the patients who returned were offered second line treatment. And uh, here the treatments were surgery, uh, levator anti trigger point injections, uh, vaginal med medications such as uh, diazepam, uh, non narcotic oral medications such as gabapentin, or referral to uh, a tertiary pain clinic. And about uh, a quarter of patients were referred to each of these things. So um, in this study, only 20% of patients referred to pelvic floor physical therapy specifically for high tone pelvic floor dysfunction are compliant with the recommended course of therapy. And this is much lower compliance that has been previously reported for pelvic floor physical therapy as we'll um, see in the next paper with Victor. Um, when it's prescribed for all indications, whether it's pelvic organ prolapse, um, fecal incontinence, urinary incontinence, and that ranges from 29 to 46%. Um, so it's, it's unclear exactly why. Uh, 
you know, high tone pelvic floor uh, patients are less compliant, but um, it, it is possible that it may be due to some of these comorbid conditions. 42.9% um, of the patients did not attend any pelvic floor physical therapy, which is, which is significantly higher than non-participatory rates that have been seen for urinary incontinence. So it's almost double. Um, so the, the rate um, in previous literature was 28.7 for non-participatory for urinary incontinence. Um, hey, 29, can, go ahead. Tom, so bef um, before you sort of, I mean, you, you sounds like you have a lot of um, history and exploration in this topic already, but before you read this paper and kind of come up, came up with this, um, this conclusion that you, that 20% uh, actually completed the therapy, for these patients, was that was that a big surprise to you, or do you think that based on your anecdotal experience with what you've done clinically so far, that's kind of in line with your expectation? Um, it was lower than I expected, and I don't know if that's specifically because a lot of my training has been within the Kaiser system, and it's a, uh -huh. a cool system. Um, and I'd be interested, um, Kim, if you can hear me, if you know what you know what your experience is as one of our treating physical therapists, um, how often our patients are completing their physical therapy. Um, I would say that my experience at UCSF is probably closer to this um, because we're getting referrals from kind of all over Northern California and we have to send them back to their, you know, their communities where there are private practice physical therapists that they go and see. Um, but, uh, I've had several patients just in my two years at UCSF where um, they've come back two or three times and uh, we've had to say, you know, we, there is no surgery for this. There is no, you know, we, we really recommend that you do your pelvic floor physical therapy before anything else. And then maybe by the third visit, they're like, okay, maybe I'll give it a try. So I don't know if it's the, the difference in the patient population or the system. Um, I'd be interested to hear other people's experience and, and their, their thoughts as well. Yeah, I think this is Kim Hale. I think um, the way they define compliance is if they finish the recommended course, which um, is not necessarily how I would define compliance. Um, and I think um, in the younger population, I feel like by the time they get to me, it's been a long time and they, they don't fully understand what's going on and they can't understand why is this happening to me and for some reason they just can't wrap their head around this is a, a musculoskeletal issue that we can help you with so I feel like there's um and it's not any uh I don't think it's the fault of like OBGYN or the providers but just whatever is in their head by the time they get to us is um not necessarily um sorry I forgot what I was saying because I started reading the slide again um <laughs> But yeah, I think the compliance is, and then once they get to us, they'll do one visit and then they'll go back. You mentioned this in the previous slide, they'll come back and say, oh yeah, I did PT and that didn't help. Um, but when you go back and look at the chart, they did one appointment, they had a follow-up appointment scheduled and they don't show up or they cancel and um, just forget to reschedule or whatever. Um, I think there's a perception of like, oh, they come to us for a visit and they're, we're gonna make them all better in their that's what they've come up with in their head, but that's not really how it works. So we really try and explain, we need you to commit and this is going to take a little while. This didn't happen overnight. And, um, and we sort of uh, push from there, at least in the, the Richmond Oakland side. Mm -hmm. One thing I'll add to about these pain patients who have these high tone pelvic floors is, um, I think a lot of times by the time we've seen them, we've like, we're like the 10th doctor they've seen, we assume that if there was a sexual abuse history, it's been discussed already, but a lot of times it hasn't been. And a lot of these um, women with the prior um, sexual abuse or physical abuse, um, I always say, you just make very some tension in your public floor more compared to other people because of what's going on with you. And they're especially nervous when you tell them you're going somewhere to have internal physical therapy. So um, just, you know, having that conversation and reassuring them that it can, it can be started externally and the physical therapist is very used to treating um, people with that prior issue. Right. Um, I feel like in the chat room, I don't know if everyone can see this chat room, but I think there's a few really good points um, here in that, you know, 
perhaps what we need to be doing is some sort of standardized counseling. Um, and this may be uh, something that could be um, something that we actually study where we try to have the providers, the referring providers sort of have a sort of checklist of what they're talking to the patients about um, to set some expectations to, to let them know like you're not going to get uh, improvement necessarily in one visit and this is truly a therapy where you're going to have to put in the work both in going to pelvic floor physical therapy but also um, with any home exercises that are given um, and returning to complete the, that therapy. Um, I don't know if this is right, this is Tom again, um, but I often sort of, I often after I get what appears to be buy-in, I set an expectation that especially for um, high tone or pelvic pain type patients, myalgia patients, I say, you know, this, with, these, with these manipulations, this work, things may actually get worse before they get better. Mm -hmm. and, and hopefully that at least um, doesn't scare them away. But according to this paper, only 7% sort of went for a visit and didn't, uh, um, so a lot of people who went for their first visit still went for their second visits. But I, I do try to, um, suggest that you might have a, bit, a little bit more soreness for the after the first few visits until things get improved. I don't know if that's uh, uh, the p physical therapist's experiences as well. This is Michelle, um, and, and I'm going to sort of cheat by hoping that Yvette's going to um, add a comment. I saw that you had typed a comment earlier, Yvette, uh, but since my patients go to her, there are two points that I always make with patients. One is you're not going to notice a change within the first two visits. You should notice a change by the fourth visit. And if you haven't, then please contact me because we need to follow up. And the other is I go into this whole spiel about why they might be taught to do Kegel exercises because they have weak parts of the, their pelvic floor. And that's why other parts of their pelvic floor are spasming to try and compensate for that. And just to take some of that, I, I think, uh, mystery about why in the world they're going to a physical therapist for pain um, out of it. Yvette, can, do you ever notice that my patients remember that at all? It looks like her um, mic is not working, so she might be typing something on the chat room. Yeah, that's. I was hoping to see something if she did. Yeah, she's coming to your office. <laughs> oh, even better. <laughs> uh, so uh, Dr. Shannon wrote that she talks to people and says it's like a Charlie horse or a muscle cramp. And I think um, one thing that I do is, um, with my patients is um, I, I sort of, and, and this may come from my background as an osteopathic physician, but I do a little bit of myofascial release with them in the office while I'm doing my exam. And I sort of show them, you know, okay, here's that pain. Do you feel that that's, that's your muscle? And then we try to get it to relax a little bit so they can feel that that might help. Um, the other thing that I do is um, I have a pelvic model and I show them the muscles and show them like, this is where I was pushing. I know that you can't necessarily feel that. You just feel something in the pelvis area, but you can't necessarily feel that that's a muscle the way that it, you do when I push on your bicep. And I don't know if that helps at all either. Um, the other thing that I noticed with some patients, which is what um, Dr. Shannon was saying earlier, is that oftentimes by the, time, by the time they get to a subspecialist, they've been sort of through the ringer and seen a lot of different people and you know they've been prescribed many different things um, tried many different things. And, um, and I noticed that at, at the end of the visit, it certainly takes a long time to explain how the myofascial, uh, component is causing their pain. Um, but, uh, that's usually at the end of the visit when, when they sort of get that, that buy-in, I noticed that there's this sort of sense of relief, like, oh, well, pelvic floor, physical therapy, it's muscles. Maybe I'll do that. But I have no idea what my patient's compliance radar is. So I have no idea if it's helpful or not. Yeah, I see Jeffrey just asked the PTs to, to chime in. So yeah, um, it, the, the no-show rate does vary, but I do have to say that um, the more that our referring providers um, have worked with us and explain like what physical therapy is, is going, is all about and what's going to happen, 
um, we get more compliance, like the ones that are directly from the pelvic pain providers or the urogynecologists, because um, they usually say, you know, F after four visits, there's no improvement, then we come back. So there's like this plan. Um, the other thing um, that had helped in the past, and we were just talking about this with the other physical therapists today, is that we had a, um, a class that just kind of talked about pain science. It, that a lot of people don't even know that there are muscles down there. So it, it really kind of helped. We had the doctor, um, the, the pain psychologist, and us explaining all of that and what therapy is entails and what the commitment involves because sometimes it's just not the right time. It's a little too overwhelming. Um, so, but uh, we have seen that, I think my no-show rate has got, went down with a lot of that and depending on who refers, um, my no-show rate will go um, up if it's just like random provider or if it's, um, if I have a long waiting list to get in, like right now it takes two months to get into me, uh, to see me. And I get a lot of no-shows that way um, because by that time they either give up or maybe the problem changed or they've moved on. Yeah, I agree with everything Yvette just said. Um, by the time they get to us, if it's been a really chronic issue, they're really frustrated. They've already, it's like somebody already said, they've already been put through the ringer and then they get to, sent to physical therapy. So when I see that, I sort of acknowledge, um, hey, you've already been to a lot of people and I understand you're frustrated, but I'm just seeing you for the first time. So we're starting from zero. Give me a chance. Let's start from here. Um, we have the same message around like four visits. If in four visits, you're not getting better, either I'm not giving you the right things to do or this is not a musculoskeletal issue. Um, and then, like a couple people have mentioned, I use analogies a lot when I'm explaining pain because I, I agree, people just don't understand pain science really well. And if I can relate it, relate it to, say, back pain or neck pain, somewhere really far away from the pelvis and talk about pain and then bring it into the pelvic floor, they're like, oh, yeah. And also explaining your pelvic floor is made of muscles because, yes, most people don't really understand what is happening in their pelvic floor. All they know is it hurts, it's near their vagina, and it scares them um, versus like neck pain is neck pain. So it's just a very different sort of um, processing of, of uh, how they process the pain. Yeah, I, I agree with Tom that we should take a look at the next study before we do more discussion. <laughs> uh, all right, I'll move this forward for, for Victor um, and uh, we can talk about um, the sort of the other points for this study after Victor talks about his. I can kind of just get this over for you. Okay. Um, so I, Tom, for just a second, I, I didn't mean to push people forward. Actually, I was talking about Steve's um, suggestion that uh, there's no longitudinal element to it. That's the next study that somebody can do. But uh, <laughs> since we got there, it's okay that Victor can take over for this next uh, discussion. <laughs> Apologies. All <That's> right. <laughs> so I'm presenting this paper uh, titled Attendance at Pelvic uh, at Prescribed Pelvic Floor Physical Therapy in a Diverse Urban Urogynecology Population, it's published by uh, Dr. Shannon, with the last author being Colleen Fitzgerald. Um, and it was published in 2018 in the journal Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. So the objective of their study was to determine rates of pelvic floor physical therapy attendance, um, both initiation and completion, as well as correlates of attendance. Uh, this is designed as a retrospective cohort study. Uh, it took place at an urban outpatient uh, clinic at a tertiary medical center, treating women with pelvic floor disorders. Uh, their main outcome was the number of pelvic floor physical therapy visits uh, recommended and attended, as well as looking at the diagnoses associated with pelvic floor physical therapy referral. Uh, Dr. Painter already talked about this um, to some degree, so we all know pelvic floor physical therapy is an evidence-based, uh, widely accepted and minimally invasive uh, therapy for many of the diagnoses that we encounter in our field. Um, so the study took patients that were referred to pelvic floor physical therapy between January 1st of 2014 through January 1st of 2000, 
15 at a tertiary care center. Uh, the prescribers were three FPMRS physicians and one PMNR pelvic pain specialist. It, it took a convenient sample of 180 patients from a total of 533 uh, patients that were prescribed uh, pelvic floor physical therapy during that time period. Uh, initiators were defined as those who attended at least one pelvic floor physical therapy session. Uh, Non-initiators were those who had no evidence of a pelvic floor physical therapy encounter in their medical record. Uh, the mean age of patients was 52. Uh, they self-identified as 68% um, were white, non-Hispanic, 22% were Hispanic, 8% uh, were black, and the remainder were other. Uh, this is just a list of the uh, different diagnoses for referral. Uh, the top three were 39% for pelvic floor myofascial pain, 22% for mixed urinary incontinence, and 18% for um, OAB wet or OAB with urge incontinence. Uh, this is the table, uh, the same data that it was uh, as it was presented in the paper, where you can appreciate here is the vast majority were for the um, myofascial pain. Uh, with a similar contribution from mixed incontinence, overactive bladder, and stress incontinence. Uh, so the results showed that about 66% or 118 of 180 initiated pelvic floor physical therapy. 29% uh, completed the, fur, uh, the full treatment course. Uh, this included patients um, that may not have necessarily uh, completed the full number of originally prescribed sessions, but uh, at some point may have been determined to uh, have met the goals of care and were discharged from pelvic floor uh, physical therapy. Uh, they found that patients that self-identified as Hispanic were less likely to initiate pelvic floor uh, physical therapy when compared with non-Hispanic patients uh, with an odds ratio of 0 0.37, uh, 0 0.37 as likely to initiate. Um, of the 118 initiators, uh, the data that was available showed that the number of recommended sessions were available for 105 or 90% uh, of patients with a mean of 8.1 recommended sessions. Uh, the number of sessions attended was uh, available for 104 or 88% uh, of patients with a mean of 6.5 sessions attended. Um, attended at least half of the recommended sessions were 77 or 74% uh, of patients uh, and uh, 52 or 50% uh, met uh, the treatment goals and were discharged from pelvic floor physical therapy. Uh, univariate comparisons showed no difference between the two cohorts in uh, these listed characteristics, age, BMI, number of comorbidities, uh, prolapse stage, marital status, insurance status, employment status, and uh, presence of urinary incontinence. Uh, so I think this uh, gives us very good information to sort of reflect as providers how uh, we are serving our patients in the form of referring them to pelvic floor physical therapy for this range of pelvic floor disorders. But it also leaves us with the questions now that um, a little bit better uh, equipped to answer how can we as clinicians help overcome the barriers that patients are facing uh, to compliance? Uh, what is the role, as we were previously discussing, of counseling uh, prior to pelvic floor physical therapy and how can that improve compliance? Um, and I think one of their most meaningful findings is what are the cultural barriers that could exist uh, to compliance with pelvic floor physical therapy? Okay. So we'll open it up to discussion and input. So I have to apologize. I actually thought we were talking about the randomized controlled trial tonight of the, for my study. <laughs> um, I actually, this study I did was to inform the, an RCT I did uh, testing an educational intervention for PT compliance. Um, but Feel free to talk about that if it's <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so after that study, I, I did a RCT um, comparing 
standard counseling, which in our practice was giving people like a, a one page sheet describing everything about PT that had been developed with our physical therapist. It's kind of our standard what we did. We explained it a little bit, gave them their paper, gave them their referral. And so we had a great marketing kind of department at Loyola. They made a nice video. So I said, I'm going to make a video because this is just ridiculous. We have such PT is so easy. Like it fix it seems to fix everything. And we just need to make compliance like really good. I didn't know what it was at that point, but um, and so I made a video, this five minute video of um, our attendings talking, two of our physical therapists talking, and one of our patients talking about her experience. And I randomized 200 women to either the standard counseling or watching the video and receiving the standard counseling. Um, even though education itself is not, uh, which I found out with the results of the study, not the, not the end all be all for compliance. There's all these other factors, motivation, all these things. So um, I included Spanish speakers as well. And I had all the research material and putting the video in Spanish as well. Um, and, and what my outcome showed is that there was actually very high compliance in both groups. In fact, um, 60 to 70% initiation and um, almost half 50% discharge from PT in both groups, but there was no difference between the two groups and compliance despite the additional counseling. Um, in fact, even though it was not significant, we found that the improvement was actually in the opposite direction than I thought. The video was less effective than just the standard counseling, but essentially one of the, our conclusions was just good counseling in general. And certainly anybody that was recruited into this study, you know, we had them do all this paperwork, you're sitting there with them talking to them more than you would have otherwise. And, and just good counseling in general, whether that be a video like I added or, or really talking to them um, about it and taking your time like Caitlin alluded to um, was probably what was effective. How much time did that extra time and effort, did, did you measure that extra amount of time that it took to be with person? We didn't because it was it was multiple different people recruiting. It wasn't just me. It was other fellows um, in residence as well. But that would have been a, a nice thing to do. But you found that um, with this directed effort of education, whether it be by the video or not, mm -hmm. uh, there was less. There was not a difference in um, the barriers to initiation or compliance to going to the therapy sessions? No, the initiation was no different, completion of 50% of visits and discharge. I, I look at all of those things for compliance because um, like there is no good way to, there's, it's hard to, to say what is good compliance for this. There's just so many ways it's described in the literature. Um, a lot of times with home exercise programs and long European literature. Um, let me just ask you then, so we can maybe kind of pull back to the other um, article that you wrote and maybe other read. So uh, I think that uh, the once somebody actually initiated, the average or mean number of sessions for for your group of all um, pelvic floor disorders, not just high tone pelvic floor disorders, was on the order of six or seven sessions. Is that correct? Yeah. That is pretty impressive, I still think. I mean, I'm, again, when maybe the physical therapist can chime in, but I, I often, when I initiate it, I usually write like an open-ended number of, like I say six to 10 sessions is what I recommend, assuming that you know, most people are not gonna get to the six sessions anyway. Yeah, we always told them average is six to 12, but it's at the discretion of your therapist and the progress you're making. I don't know if one of the therapists wants to, to talk about that. I, I would love if my patients came for six to 10 sessions. <laughs> this is Kim talking. Um, I think part of it is uh, it's an access issue in the Kaiser system. Um, I feel like outside of Kaiser or private, pac private practice or um, pay services, uh, they're able to get people to comply a little bit more, but their business sort of depends on that. And uh, I think that's a little different than our system is. Um, I, I, I think uh, one of the things we try on our end is in follow-up, usually people will opt for an actual appointment, but I do also offer like, would you like a TAV? Would you like messaging? Like, how can I stay in contact with you and keep you moving forward if you feel like you can't come in for your appointments? Um, so those are some of the things that, we'll, that we will do. But um, I feel like one of the questions up there is overcoming barriers to compliance. Uh, 
one of the things that might be helpful on the provider end before they get referred is sort of asking the patient, does it make sense that this issue could be coming from your muscles and causing your pain? Um, and are you ready to participate? Um, because I think, again, you know, we sort of talk about what's the um, physical therapy is a little different than going to the doctor and uh, maybe getting a medication or getting a different type of uh, treatment. It's somebody mentioned earlier, it's more long term, it's therapy, it's participatory. So testing that readiness uh, may help on our end by the time they get past. I think that's a really good point, Kim, that you make about um, asking for, for readiness. I know that that's not something that I, I typically uh, ask about because they're like, especially the pain, high tone pelvic floor patients are like, just want something. They just want something. And I'm like, well, we have this, but then I, I don't ask them like, okay, well, are you ready to start pelvic floor physical therapy? Even though they're sort of desperate, I'm like, well, look, this is what you need to do. Um, I don't ask, you know, is it the right time in your life? Are you, do you have the capacity to actually go and, uh, and participate in this program? Yeah, and a lot of times um, the, there is, con, you know, concomitant um, other, just, so for example, there may be a modest cystocele that is there as well that in my mind makes me wonder, is the pelvic floor disorder, whatever it happens to be, whether it's the prolapse itself or an associated urinary incontinence or pain, is that causing, um, is that the causative factor or is the, let's say the cystocele, is that actually dropping down into the space where the feeling of um, something being wrong is, is the guarding reflex by the, the person's body to try to um, overcome whatever is going on. And, and then in that case, if you ask them, are you ready to participate in, in, um, in therapy, in physical therapy, a lot of times it seems like the answer is no. And then we as the surgeon are sitting there with our scalpel ready to operate when maybe that's not the right thing and trying to find that balance is really challenging. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the other thing that I wanted to point out from the, the other paper, and it would be interesting to hear from the San Francisco um, team, is um, the, that the comorbid conditions of anxiety and depression. So uh, we know from prior literature um, just about anxiety and depression in general that those patients are less compliant especially with depression, with medical recommendations across the board, um, including, you know, for in within the cardiology literature, um, depressed patients will not do the things that they need to do. Um, and so we also know that our chronic pain patients have a two to three increase, two to three percent increased risk of uh, of having anxiety and depression as comorbid conditions. And so should we be treating treating at the same time or before pelvic floor physical therapy, um, or should, is it something that we can do sort of in this group visit in a multidisciplinary visit where we're treating the anxiety and depression at the same time so that they're not too depressed to actually go to their pelvic floor physical therapy appointments. Um, and I think having a pain psychologist is wonderful. And I, I'm just curious how that worked at uh, Kaiser San Francisco um, and if you know, you noticed having the pain psychologist right there, if that helped in any way. Um, I am going to jump in because I think um, it's, it's been a real help for those patients that are um, where the, so the anxiety is component can be really strong for someone with vaginismus or that's had trauma. And sometimes just coming to the appointment is, is all that they can do. And so having a few sessions with the pain psychologist that kind of gives them just that it's, it's, it's a much more productive appointment for them to go there to ease them into coming to see this. And that's worked tremendously. We have initially used to use them like when those people would no show, like they would show up, they wouldn't show up and then they would reschedule and they still wouldn't show up. And finally it was like, you can't come to see the physical therapist until you see the pain psychologist. And that worked significantly better. Um, 
But there are some people where the anxiety is more the anxiety about this pelvic pain that they've had forever. And finally coming to us, they actually, um, you know, their anxiety is significantly decreased because they, they are starting to address the pain. And then um, the pain psychologist can kind of, it can be concurrent or it might be afterwards when they have to make that jump, for example, to, um, you know, get be sexually active again or something like that. Um, that like that next step that could create some other anxiety. So it, it works extremely well to have um, another member so we don't have to do a lot, feel like we're the psychological counselor because it does feel like that sometimes. And we're not trained for it <laughs> that well. <laughs> but I, I, the, I saw that like one of the other lines is the cultural barriers. And I did notice that um, the Hispanic population, um, I don't know, can I jump into that? Or did you guys yeah. Yeah, yeah, please do. Um, at the Hispanic population, it's, um, it, it was really strong. One, they're very black and white about their pain. Um, they don't understand this gray in between, so they don't see like the the um, the small incremental progress. Um, it's very difficult to get them, you know, to um, to see that like pain scale would be like ten all the time. Um, and the other thing, the cultural barrier is oh, the dilator. If you know their um, spouse is oh my, they they're very like significant religious background like to even work with a dilator was very, very difficult. And I've seen that. And I see that more with the older population, the younger population coming in, I've noticed a difference that it, they're much, it, they're much more open. I just noticed in the last five years, um, it's starting to change. I don't know if they're, my patients are better prepped coming to me, <laughs> um, but I've noticed an improvement from, you know, from the, like at least five years ago. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely an age associated thing, for sure. Um, and do you have um, like an in-person translator or do you speak Spanish or do you just use like an, uh, a telephone translator? Um, so both, we used to have like an in-person translator and then I speak some Spanish, but um, now we're moving to the iPad, like a, like a remote person um, and less with the in-person translator. But I remember asking, um, I remember asking one of my translators because this patient, I just couldn't get them to understand like, you know, the whole pain science of everything. And um, she did actually mention to me, she's like, it also depends on their education level as well. Like the lower education level, they really, um, they really have a hard time. Like they're just very, very black and white about their pain. So I just kind of changed my approach significantly if I felt that that was, coming in. So it was actually nice having an in-person translator that was actually from the same country as the patient um, to understand that. But that was just a nice learning barrier. But um, it is, I have to say, we're, we're getting away from the in-person translator, I think, for costs, and we're just using the, the remote translator. But having an in-person one, um, if, it, if the person is comfortable, it has worked significantly better, obviously. But um, yeah, but if it was like a, a gender issue, then it didn't work as well. So, you know. Mm -hmm. um. I think uh, Steve has raised his hand and uh, wanted to say <laughs> some things here at the end. I want to thank everybody for their participation, Steve. I'm showing off with my Zoom functionality knowledge with the <laughs> raise and lower the hand. Um, I have to thank everyone. I really appreciate such a rich discussion and everyone is giving great ideas and insight into how to enhance compliance and get people uh, to stay on a plan. Uh, I did want to tie it back to the research articles in question and, and I always try to come up with some kind of statement is where, where do we go from here? And I think on the chat room, most people have kind of gotten the idea that the retrospective nature of these studies is a huge limitation, right? We don't have control over how patients are counseled. 
So in other words, if the clinician kind of gives them a lukewarm feeling, maybe they go once or not at all. And that has a lot to do with it, I find, in our practice. Uh, the other thing is we have no control over what the experiences were before enrollment, so to speak. I mean, patients were uh, basically enrolled if they were referred, but we don't know how many times in the past they might have been referred or what, what other interventions have been you know, planned in, in, in the past. And especially with the high tone pelvic floor dysfunction patients, many of these patients, even though the mean age was 47-ish, if I recall, or 42-ish, uh, they could be patients for decades in that category. And so I think uh, the ideal uh, methods would be a prospective study where we have some kind of enhanced counseling uh, as well as some kind of better understanding on who really should go to physical therapy. And then once you kind of wed them to that therapy, really to figure out compliance. Because I think the summary is the, the participation is not very high. We could call that compliance or just participation, but we don't really know why from these two papers. Uh, and I really appreciate Megan's input as far as her follow-up RCT, which uh, I wish we had put that one into today's discussion, but the fact that we got her to talk about it was just really a gem. And that is that, you know, maybe even our best effort at counseling isn't really going to do it. You know, there might be a hard number of, of expected failure uh, in all of these populations of pelvic floor disorders where people just can't make it. And I'm sitting here thinking of, you know, my dementia wheelchair bound patients who I have nothing else to offer to. And I think, yeah, but they're probably not going to wheel into physical therapy nor remember their home exercise regimen. And there's just some reality to this that we're not going to be 100% successful. Um, but that's kind of what I wanted to leave the group with and, and hopefully leave time to, to provide some critical comments towards what I just said, if anyone else uh, has some other thoughts. Um, that's all I had to say, really. Thanks, Steve. I wanted to just add in the way I was looking at this. First of all, I, I kind of asked, well, why do we consider it a mainstay if 20 to 30 percent of patients are actually willing to do it? Like, would we accept a drug that only 20 to 30 percent of patients were willing to to take? And kind of in the same vain to think about those reasons that the patients said that they were not compliant, the, that they didn't feel there was any benefit, the cost, their anxiety, the amount of time it took to go to physical therapy. I, again, I, I think we should think about that as like side effect or, or maybe the risks of surgery and, and whether or not that's worth it for some people. And, and that might help with the counseling also to say, well, this will be the side effect of what you, what we are recommending. It, it, what do you think, or is that does the treatment seem worth it to you? I'm just just thinking about ways to try and, and talk to the patients about it. Yeah, I, I think looking at it prospectively, the question always is, you know, it, it's especially with the Cleveland Clinic study, um, the Woodburn study, it, they're. Basically, if the clinician referred you and then you didn't go, it's a problem, right? Well, but many of us are seeing a patient after 10 other different specialties have seen the patient and have all sorts of interventions and perhaps have physical therapy for other reasons, right? So they're frankly not going to attend pelvic floor PT because they have PT for their arm or their elbow, shoulder, et cetera. Um, you know, none of that is really taken into account. And it has to do with more of a structured look at it and then it's almost like you have to tee up a patient that you clinically think really is an ideal candidate for pelvic floor physical therapy and actually stands a chance of doing it uh, because these retrospective studies are kind of looking at the reality of our current situation. I just think it has to be measured in, in other ways. Well, we do think uh, nine o'clock now guys on the east coast and um, I don't want to cut you off Steve but I also want to respect everybody's time because I think we did have a really great conversation. We talked about retrospective studies, we talked about future studies that actually had happened and we, we still have more fodder for future um, future studies that could be submitted to multiple journals. So, <laughs> including okay. FPMRS. So I do want to thank everybody. I just want to remind everybody that February 10th, 2020 is the next one of these, uh, 9 a.m. Eastern time, 6 a.m. Pacific time, 3 a.m. Hawaii time, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> or two or five four I mean so okay thanks a bunch everybody
All right. Thank you. See you later. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you very Thank much you. for participating. So we're on. How do I get myself out of this? <laughs> um.